American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette. We're so glad you're with us to stay curious. I'm here with Hugh Harris, the former public information officer and voice of NASA. Hello, Hugh. Great to see you again. Good to be here. Well, good to be. We're glad, so glad that you want to spend some time with us at the beginning of every month as we're going to talk about the shuttles of March and also a Gemini and Apollo launch in, uh, in this month. Uh, but uh, we're glad to have you be part of our our program here, and we are coming to you from the Hyatt Place Studios inside the American Space Museum, Hugh. We've partnered with them. We're going to do some events at the beautiful Hyatt Place there on Route 1. Don't know if you've been inside that facility yet. No, I haven't, but I'm looking forward to it. Well, we're looking forward to having Hugh there in an event I'm going to share with you in just a second. But we also want to remind everybody that our auction is uh, our 19th memorabilia auction is Saturday. You can participate here at our museum by showing up at noon or uh, doing it online through our AmericanSpaceMuseum.com. Just hit the, at the top is the auction button. It'll take you, get you all lined up for over 400 items you are gonna be auctioned from wow. uh, astronaut signed autographs to uh, all kinds of photographs. We've even got Marty's jacket that he wore in the launch complex uh, during his days of uh, for the launch process services. And Marty Winkle, my cameraman or co-producer of this show for almost two years. We've done over 500 episodes and we're, we're glad to have Hugh Harris with us today. Over 35 years he was involved in NASA uh, beginning in 1985 as the Deputy uh, Public Affairs Officer and uh, you know we're we are going to do an event with Hugh, and you can increase that, Marty. We're putting this flyer together for an April 16th event at the Hyatt Place that we're promoting uh, from our Hyatt Place studios here. We're going to have an event celebrating the golden anniversary of the dawn of the space shuttle era, because in 1972 in April, Hugh, U.S. Congress approved. $5.5 billion to build the space transportation system. And as we put it, it changed the world, didn't it? Yeah, well, it, it really did. And it changed the way that we did business in space. Uh, it was probably one of the most innovative uh, and capable uh, things that we've developed to date. Absolutely, and we've already got commitments from uh, Bob Seek, Mike Leinbach, and Jim Harrington, launch directors. Hugh is going to be our, our master of ceremonies and, and help with that. Uh, Jay Honeycutt is uh, launch uh, Kennedy, Kennedy Space Center uh, director, uh, wants to be involved, as does Mike McCulley, not only as an astronaut, but Hugh, people don't realize what a leader he was with the United Space Alliance, uh, oh, Mike oh, McCulley. Oh, absolutely. And, uh, you know, he did a terrific job. The United Space Alliance uh, uh, really brought together uh, large companies uh, at a common purpose that uh, I think paid great dividends for the country. Well, we've got people like Terry White, uh, OPF manager, uh, Dean Schaff, who was a transoceanic abort landing site leader over there, Gene Wright, a good friend of our museum. Uh, with the, th the thermal protection system and her so sisters and uh, Triple T will be doing a little talk there. We tend, tend to have a kind of a, a fellowship of people getting together listening to some talks and then in the afternoon having a, a big, uh, uh, not a round robin, but uh, a, a panel discussion of the shuttle era uh, from uh, its inception to uh, Mike Lineback being the last launch director of STS-135 on Ju in July uh, 2011. So we hope that you all want to enjoy uh, a time with us there. Uh, and we'll be, of course, talking more about that here on Stay Curious as well as uh, bringing you some uh, on Facebook and so forth. Uh, also want to, we intended to have a throwback Thursday uh, of a young picture of this man. Don't know what happened to John Tribe. Big shout out to John Tribe. Thank you for all you do promoting our museum and all of our events. Here he is talking to some British students that were in our museum in 2019 before the pandemic. And I had a picture of John that you sent me 
1966. Don't know what happened to it on our Streamlabs here, but a little throwback and acknowledgement to John Tribe there, uh, who's done a lot for our, our museum. You know John very well. Yes, and you could really do a whole program on John. Uh, he worked out on the uh, Atlas pads, and I think he was a major, major contributor to this, this first successful uh, John Glenn launch. Oh, absolutely. We've had him on the show a couple times. We want to have him back, but yes, he's got some great stories to tell, working with Rockwell in the space shuttle early days, but he was a hypergolics expert on the command module mm -hmm. with Rockwell. And, uh, uh, but thank you for all you do, John. Uh, we're, we also want to have some birthdays going on today. We've got three birthdays, Hugh. So we're going to have a nice long show today. So you stay curious fans out there, just get you a, a nice refreshment and sit back because we got three birthdays to talk about today and a whole bunch of shuttle launches and a couple, a Gemini and Apollo one too. But this is happy birthday to Donnie, uh, Bonnie Dunbar is 73 years old, five space flights, totaling 50 days for her there. And uh, uh, she uh, does a lot of speaking around. She's, Bonnie was born in Sunnyside, Washington, mm -hmm. the state of Washington. And uh, her five missions uh, included two dockings with the Mir Space Station. That had to be exciting always to go up and peek around inside the mirror. Uh, there's a, another beautiful picture of Bonnie Dunbar celebrating her birthday today. And, and oh, what happened? Okay, I had another picture of Bonnie in there that uh, was in her blues. Uh, so uh, some of my Streamlab pictures are dropping out today. It's been one of them kind of days. But we got Hugh Harris with me to save the day here today. Also, happy birthday to Jim Voss. Jim was born in Cordova, Alabama, and raised by his grandparents in Opal, Opelika, Alabama. Right. So I'll bet he bleeds Crimson Tide all the way through. What do you think, Hugh? Well, he, he may very well. <laughs> but I forgot where he went to college, so... Um... Oh, of course he went to Auburn. <laughs> okay. he, uh, Auburn University. Uh, he wrestled on the Auburn University wrestling team. Okay. And uh, impressive to me is he was on the second expedition uh, of the International Space Station. There he is in the brand spanking new Destiny module, uh, breaking that in. Uh, and uh, uh, his, Susan Helms was up there on the ISS mm -hmm. on, as a second. And they did an eight hour. 56-minute spacewalk, the longest to date, almost a nine-hour spacewalk, which pushes that life support system, doesn't it, Hugh? Well, it, it does, but there, there's a, a lot of margin that's built into those. And there's Jim, wanted to shout out to all you ham radio operators. He was a big ham, and there is an autograph to a person named Tony. Thanks for the great amateur radio support. I enjoyed talking to you from the ISS. Though I'm not a ham, I've talked to people around the world on other ham radio operators. Are you a ham? Uh, no. No. Well, you know that they, astronauts, uh, some, they, they love that up there talking around the world, didn't they? That's right. Is there anything special you remember about being a ham operator uh, with the astronauts? No? <laughs> well, <laughs> since I'm not, I, I, I was a ham in that I was involved in the theater a lot. Yeah, okay, yeah, well, we're both a ham, uh, being public relations people, that's a good point, a different kind of ham. I remember a mission that they wanted to have all ham radio operators on it, and Jerry mm -hmm. Ross was on that, not, <clears throat> not Jim Voss. And Jerry um, wasn't a ham operator, and he kind of reluctantly learned the Morse code to be, so he could they could say everyone on there communicated. And I think the last day in orbit... Uh, though Jerry Ross is a great guy, he just wasn't into it. Right. I think the last day in orbit, he finally talked to somebody so they could say that they had a... Do you remember that crew? I know there's 135 of them to remember you, but does that strike... Uh, well, am I telling tales, or do you remember No, I... I, I yeah. Well, what I, what I remember is that practically every crew uh, was, was different and had a real rapport... The, the fact that they had to work on what they were going to do in space for 
a couple of years, sometimes even longer, uh, brought them together as a group and uh, uh, made them uh, real friends for life. Yeah, yeah, and uh, really, and, and even maybe communicating with each other. Uh, uh, it's, yeah, you're right. It's so uh, you never know how the crews are going to, uh, I guess, bond, do you? Mm -hmm. And uh, But uh, they do. <laughs> uh, and some keep in touch with each other, and uh, some have been on multiple uh, crews together, too. Well, we wanted to give another big shout-out birthday to this gentleman, uh, uh, Jim Adamson, James Craig Adamson, was born in Warsaw, New York on March 3rd, 1946. Happy 76th birthday to you, Jim. Uh, he's been on, he was on two shuttles, 14 days. One was a DOD mission. Here he is on uh, the STS-43, uh, which uh, we're going to have Jim uh, Anderson on Stay Curious next Wednesday. Hello, hope you're watching with your good friend Jay Honeycutt. I know they do a lot of things together. Mm -hmm. Do you see Jim in your rounds around Merritt Island? No, I saw Jay yesterday. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, Jim turned out to be one of the uh, most effective uh, CEOs of companies. Uh, and um, there, there's a great crossover between being able to manage what you're going to do in space, I think, and what you're able to manage uh, with, in many cases, thousands of people uh, in other industries. Well, I'm getting to know Jim Anderson. He's really a humble man, I can tell. Uh, we, we've both been rocking mustaches most of our lives, so I like <laughs> that about him. Uh, and in researching for our, our, our conversation next Wednesday, uh, he was involved as a test pilot and flight controller in aerodynamics of the early shuttle. You're right, he was the first chief operating officer of the United Space Alliance, helping mm -hmm. uh, merge that $1.5 billion company, consolidating all of NASA's operations. Uh, he was a Vietnam veteran. Uh, 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 decorated in Vietnam uh, with the Bronze Star. Uh, Marty was a helicopter pilot uh, over there too. Uh, Marty, a pilot. Marty was a Marine. Huh? Who was a pilot? Jim Anderson, okay. uh, astronaut Jim. I don't think he flew the uh, Skorskis that, that you were ro doing roping out of uh, as a Marine, but uh, I always like pointing that out. Uh, he was one of 11 astronauts selected to hold management positions within NASA. Mm -hmm. Like you said, it's, it's a hard thing to segue into. What, and he's still active on a lot of boards, uh, gives his time on advisory, he's still an advisory council uh, uh, to the NASA administrator. And uh, what I love about him that I want to find out is he was a West Point pistol champion. He was captain of the West Point championship pistol team. I didn't realize that. So he's a dead-eye shot out there, you better believe. <laughs> That's a picture I'm, when I met Jim at the Rocket Reunion there. And I uh, can't wait to share some time with him and let our Stay Curious watchers get to know a, a real fine person here, uh, Jim Anderson. Happy birthday to you and Bonnie Dunbar and uh, Jim Voss today sharing March 3rd as their birthdays. So, all right. We also wanted to say a formal goodbye to this gentleman, uh, Ike Ridgel. Isom Ike Ridgel. Tell Bird. the people about Ike Ridgel a little bit there, Hugh. Well, he, he goes back uh, to the very beginning. He came from uh, really the Von Braun team uh, at uh, Marshall uh, and moved down here. And... Um, during the, uh, that period, he was involved with all of the earlier launches and, uh, and also was the, uh, I think, deputy launch director. To next uh, to Rocco for, Patron, right. definitely. Yeah, they were very good friends. And were they? He, mm -hmm. uh, Ike was a person who really cared about other people, and he was the, uh, the real force behind the fact that the uh, Launch Control Center out at the center uh, has been named after Rocco Patron uh, now, and um, the but he was uh, very giving and and a major uh, 
a contributor and a supporter of the um, of the alumni of NASA Alumni League, mm. and um, I think he probably brought more guests to Alumni League lunches than any other person, and um, had a great family. And uh, there's his wife Catherine. Young. God bless her and her whole family. And uh, what a pleasure for me to get to know this gentleman over the last four years because. I got to know him when we started promoting his book, Ike. He would, when we were doing before COVID, when we did a Saturday, uh, mm -hmm. once a month uh, constellation <clears throat> celebration series event that we were uh, uh, putting together. He he enjoyed being there at those. Uh, uh, I mean, it was uh, of course uh, Al Kohler, Dr. Al Kohler's a great friend of their family, and and just just uh like you said a very kind person his wife the same way well he uh, has some words of wisdom i think for you he did uh, okay <laughs> he did well he did for me and uh, i'll pass them along uh i was working on my book about challenger and um, he was the one that i went to because of his uh, really vast knowledge of what had happened uh, to find out the derivation of scrub and um, hmm. why that's used for when a uh, launch is uh, uh, is stopped and uh, and postponed and uh, I told him the uh, the two meanings that uh, I thought it might have come from and uh, he said well be aware that whatever you write is the way history is recording that that is the way what it actually means so i think that the same thing is uh applicable to broadcasters yes it is who, who uh, say you know here is the facts mm -hmm. and uh then forever after hundreds thousands of people remember that well you're so right in talking to uh, hugh harris here whose words uh, have been echoed around the world uh, at uh uh, hundreds of events and so forth. No, you're absolutely right. And I always say, don't let the facts get in the way of your opinion. <laughs> okay. Because <laughs> some people, you can't convince <clears throat> that the earth is round, for example, you know. Uh, that's but, that's uh, true. So sometimes you <laughs> throw up your hands and say, but uh, what, a, what, a, what a blessing. Uh, uh, Ike is in paradise, and uh, God bless him and all that he's done for this museum. And our Apollo space program, again, a man that, that was behind the scenes with Rocco Patron in the launch uh, control center that uh, uh, they, they had to run things in kind of a different way than we do today. It, it was oh. more of an iron hand and, because everything they did, Hugh, was doing it kind of for the first time. Well, that's this right. This guy helped invent and what a launch control director is, correct? Well, that's true. And uh, one of the things that uh, he always could talk about was the way that we got to where we are now and how we, uh, in the case of uh, launches, the technology had changed so tremendously during the years. But I can remember him staying in, standing in a black house, a block house uh, out in um, uh, the... Uh, uh, pads that were used for the redstone and uh, telling me why there was a big tank on top of a uh, scale there. And it turned out that instead of having flow meters that could tell you we put in this many gallons, they had to weigh the um, uh, some of the propellants and they weighed them on an actual scale in the blockhouse. Wow. And uh, so huh. the technology has changed tremendously. Oh, uh, yeah. The pad 14 you're talking about. And, right. Uh, th those out there, yeah. <clears throat> they're, uh, I mean, people even look at the lunar module that Marty Winkle worked on with Grumman, and that's like crude compared to what we're, we're, we're going to go back with. But, yeah, these pioneers, uh, uh, like yourself, Hugh, we're, we're, we, we love him, we cherish him, and uh, we're glad that we've gotten to know this gentleman and his wife and share their story over and over. And there was a beautiful story in the uh, Florida Today uh, right. this week about him in there. So we wanted to say goodbye to, to Ike Rigel 
and, uh, and his family are in our thoughts and prayers. Well, there you are. Okay, actually, I think the tag on that photograph, Hugh, was STS-26. It could so, have been. <laughs> so that would have been after the Challenger accident, somewhere around 1988 there. Uh, don't know who you're talking to there, but kind of just a, uh, another day at the, at the, at the, at work. Well, well there were, there were a lot of... Another day at the rocket ranch. Yeah, another day at the rocket ranch, Marty. I was gonna say salt mine, but because uh, <laughs> no. I'm up there and uh, grew up near to the salt mines of Detroit. But yes, uh, uh, just we love showing pictures of people that we have on here in their job back in the day in there, and uh, uh, you know we we always we always look back. We look different. We looked younger. We had more hair. We <laughs> whatnot, but. Uh, uh, Again, being interviewed as the voice of NASA, disseminating the knowledge that, that he's that he's told from uh, the technicians and the astronauts. Well, our shuttles of March, and we've got more than just shuttles of March. We've got uh, uh, ten shuttles there, Hugh, and we've already launched STS-109 is orbiting the Earth uh, in 2022. March 2nd, we saw Astro-1 launched. All right. And uh, tomorrow we're going to launch uh, Andy Allen, a friend of ours, on his first flight, STS-62, and so on and so forth as we talk about them in there. But we're going to particularly talk about STS-3 today. And on March 22nd was launched and then landed a couple days later uh, uh, at White Sands, uh, New Mexico, the only time we've landed there. Hugh's going to tell us a little bit about the logistics nightmare of that. But also we wanted to talk about, and I didn't pull up any slides, uh, today in space history, in 1969, Apollo 9 was launched with uh, Tom Stafford, Gene Cernan, and, no, not Tom Stafford, Gene Cernan, that was, uh, uh, Jim, Jim McDivitt, McDivitt was the commander, David Scott, and Rusty Schweikert. And Scott, and all three of them are alive. This is one of the few Apollo crews, Apollo 8 mm -hmm. is also the other one that they're all alive. Uh, Hugh, tell us a little bit about uh, 1969 Apollo 9. Well, that was uh, a very exciting step in our being able to go to the moon. Uh, that was the first time that we actually tested uh, the lunar, land, uh, lunar module uh, and lander in space. And uh, the, the primary purpose there was to make sure that it would be capable of getting the people from the um, uh, the orbiting uh, Apollo um, uh, con uh, configuration down to the surface of the moon and back again. And back again was very significant, mm -hmm. <laughs> especially if you were one of the astronauts on it. And uh, what they did was they uh, uh, they d disconnected it, actually, it's the first time it was flown, and uh, disconnected it from the uh, command module, and then fired both of the, the engines um, for taking it out of orbit down to the moon, and the engine for uh, getting back to the uh, orbiting uh, Apollo command module to come back to Earth. And um, it went very successfully and uh, was quite a flight. Um, in Earth orbit, uh, well, it was. Well, that, yeah. that's right. Uh -huh. And um, so it was... Uh, it was, and, and, and Hugh, <clears throat> uh, uh, though you, you were working at Lewis Research Center in Ohio at the time, right? Right. Up on Lake Erie. But they had to come up with a, a, a new call sign. They just couldn't say Apollo 9, you know, because you had two vehicles. You had... Uh, so they came up with a name of uh, gumdrop mm -hmm. for the command module because it looked like a gumdrop and spider for the lunar module because it looked like a spider. And I suppose, McDivitt, I suppose yes. McDivitt had something to do with that. Well, I'm sure they all... <laughs> then Apollo, but the public affairs wouldn't have overrode any of that, would oh, they? Oh, no. Well, they, the astronauts... Uh, did the naming of their own uh, spacecraft and uh, 
and had various reasons for it. And uh, I think we're going to talk about... Um, uh, yeah, we're going to talk uh, about the uh, the famous... Yeah, we'll... we'll uh, so, but yes, the uh, Apollo 9 three. complete success. I Sorry I didn't pull off any graphics for that. Uh, but we're going to talk about Gemini 3. There's two Gemini launches in, in uh, March. Gemini 3... Uh, the maiden flight, which you, uh, Hugh will tell us about, called Molly Brown. And Gemini 8 was uh, the 16th. of, of uh, uh, And we're going to have a guest in here um, on the 16th that worked on the, from, from McDonald, Gary, uh, uh, Gary Hayward. Mm -hmm. Gary Hayward was an electrician, and he was all involved in Gemini 8 that almost turned into a fatal accident when the thruster stuck on Gemini and spun Neil Armstrong and David Scott around. So two flights for David Scott in March. That's that right. just kind of dawned on me, Ge uh, Gemini 8 and uh, Apollo 9. But tell us a little bit about the famous uh, flight of Gemini 3, Gus Grissom, his second flight in space, with John Young, a rookie. And you know, a lot of people don't know that John Young Parkway in Orlando is named after John Young. Really? He was, he was born in... <laughs> oh, yeah, we do tours. And who's from Orlando? And I go, do you, John Young Parkway. Oh, yeah, we know. Well, this is the guy on the wall here that they named that after. And he actually was born in San Francisco but grew up in Orlando. Well, John was a, is a tremendous person in the, uh, and, and very, very humble. And uh, n not, uh, you know, he never was very forward in introducing himself. Uh, he was unlike a, a number of other astronauts uh, in that uh, he sort of was just quiet, and, uh, but he had a, uh, a very interesting sense of humor. And the, um, for instance... Yeah, tell us <laughs> about his sense of humor on Gemini. GT3, Gemini Titan, three Roman numerals, folks. Well, the <laughs> uh, yeah, I wasn't thinking about that in particular. I was thinking about the first time that he saw uh, the space shuttle stack uh, in the vehicle assembly building, and the um, somebody asked him what he thought, uh, and he looked up and he says, "Sure is big." <laughs> <laughs> is that what he said? <laughs> but uh, he. Uh, but a, a, a Gemini 3, which uh, uh, you were mentioning, um, uh, which was the, uh, uh, the, the Molly Brown, um, probably... Who is Molly Brown? Let's talk about... First, we've got to set up Gus Grissom's Mercury capsule suborbital sank to the ocean. Well, well Mo Molly Brown, of course, was a, a famous uh, uh, musical comedy that was on Broadway. And it was called really the unsinkable Molly Brown, and so because <laughs> she was a woman that survived the Titanic. Yes, and she she actually uh, survived the Titanic disaster. Well, and and the uh, uh, because of um, of the problem that uh, Gus Grissom had had uh, with the Mercury capsule, uh, which sank. Uh, <laughs> they, uh, it was decided that by, uh, I'm sure, just by uh, Grissom and Young to say, you know, hey, this is not going to sink. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, uh, and so they named their spacecraft uh, the Molly Brown. The thing that people used to remember about that, and I don't know about it anymore, uh, whether they do, was that was the famous ham sandwich uh, corned that, beef sandwich. Corned beef sandwich, right. That was uh, I'm correcting smug. Hugh Harris. I can't pinch myself anymore. That's a <laughs> well, as long as you, yeah. Well, it, it's easy. I, I don't remember everything perfectly. We forgive uh, you. Uh, but the uh, uh, there, there was a great consternation as to whether people should just laugh or be horrified that something that had not been approved for space flight was smuggled aboard a, a spacecraft and flew in space. And of course, the, uh, the rationale for people who thought, you know, that was awful was the fact that uh, 
anything, breadcrumbs or whatever might come from it, uh, would just sort of fly, float around inside and could get into the electronics or something. But um, that didn't happen. Everything went fine. And I'm sure they enjoyed the uh, corned beef sandwich. Yes, uh, a Wolfie's corned beef sandwich, a famous rest restaurant in Cocoa Beach. And uh, it was like a 30-second incident that, that John pulled out to, to, to his commander and says, you want a bite? And, and Gus <laughs> says, like, where, where'd, you, where'd you get that from? And uh, Wolfie's, and I, I, I think Gus took a bite and said, put that away. And that was it. And here, when, after they landed, here is uh, 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 the uh, executive Mueller. What was his first name? George? When, uh, Mueller, yeah, George, George, George Mueller. George Mueller, uh, a very important uh, executive, uh, right-hand man to James Webb, who has been front of a House of Representatives Council in Congress uh, explaining, <laughs> why are we spending money on space food on these little cubes and stuff when when you're smuggling food on board. It really grilled him over that thing. I've, I've right. kind of been fascinated with Mueller and some of these executives like that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, they actually pulled him up to Congress to talk about that. But, uh, yeah, that's a great incident. Gemini 3, a flawless mission with, with two great astronauts uh, that, that, that put Gus Grissom on the fast track. I mean, it is a big deal to test drive a brand new spaceship yes. on the maiden flight. And, uh, and then, of course, John Young, coincidentally, uh, was on the maiden flight of uh, the, the first shuttle. Uh, so that, two maiden right. flights yeah. out of, in his career. And um, we're talking with Hugh Harris, and the, Hugh was talking about, I was in a, uh, the great John Young and, I'll just, and all the launches they talk about. And I was in a press pool interviewing him one time. And someone said, well, Mr. Young, what was your, your favorite of your six rocket launches? And he did his oh shucks thing. He goes, well, uh, there was a seventh launch that was pretty important to me. And everyone's going, seventh launches? Yeah, yeah, that launch off the moon on Apollo 16, <laughs> I consider uh, the, the most important one. So uh, uh, a man of few words, but boy, was he sharp and, oh, yes. and, 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 yeah. and, and joking all the time about that, mm -hmm. you know, in there. So, well, we're going to look at a few more things going on of our shuttles of the month here. Uh, we, um, we, we talked about uh, the Hubble telescope uh, upgrade, the fourth of, of five upgrades, or the first was a repair mission, launched uh, March 1st uh, in this month of March. Uh, Hugh, you wanted to comment about that, that Hubble repair mission. Well, yeah, that, that was uh, really uh, a stretch of technology when the... Uh, when the Hubble was built, it was built uh, uh, so that it could be serviced in space. And the, um, uh, when the space shuttle was built, it was envisioned as a uh, spacecraft that could both take up space, other spacecraft and launch them, uh, and also could rendezvous and and uh, bring them back to Earth or to service them. And of course, the, uh, that mission, um, there were, uh, I guess, five uh, service missions to the Hubble. And that extended the uh, uh, lifetime of the, uh, of the Hubble uh, a great deal uh, from what if, if we had just launched it and left it there. And, um, one of the um, uh, the things that I think uh, was so important about the fact that we had foreseen uh, servicing of uh, satellites in space was the fact that when the Hubble got there, they had the problem with the uh, lenses, with the uh, spherical aber it was called a spherical aberration, where the lens was not quite um, uh, made to the right specifications as far as focusing uh, on the uh, on the universe as uh, as it was supposed to, and uh, which, if I recall right, had to do with the uh, really the atmosphere it was in partly. Uh, 
mm -hmm. if you can call the vacuum of space an atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And um, so uh, both uh, uh, spacecraft, the Hubble itself, and the uh, uh, space shuttle sort of proved themselves, uh, 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 their capabilities during those servicing flights and um, uh, resulted in the, uh, the, the Hubble uh, being serviceable uh, well through last year. But um, there were some spin-offs from the but, Hubble. Well, there's yes, and uh, one thing I wanted to mention, uh, and that is that this is uh, Women's Hi uh, National Women's History Month, mm -hmm. and um, the spin-offs from the Hubble uh, are directly uh, used in um, in women's uh, medicine. Uh, uh, particularly in the area of breath, uh, breast cancer. And um, the, uh, the sensors uh, that were used on uh, the, uh, the Hubble were able to be uh, repurposed uh, for looking at very, very small objects uh, uh, in uh, viruses and that sort of thing. And um, as a matter of fact, uh, you know, if we go a little bit further, the, the space program actually has been not just about space. Uh, it's really been about uh, improving our knowledge so that it can be used on Earth. And um, there have been hundreds and hundreds of um, uh, what are usually called spin-offs, but advances in the technology that are used here on Earth uh, uh, today. And uh, as a matter of fact, there's uh, uh, agreements that have been signed between NASA and other government agencies such as uh, Health and Human Services. And one of those agreements uh, 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 came in uh, October of 1997 uh, at the time and a big ceremony at the congressional uh, uh, building uh, with congressmen and uh, hmm. representatives of various ones, uh, which had to, uh, the perp, um, which agreed uh, to um, that NASA would help the Health and Human Services. Uh, identify, develop, and transfer NASA technologies uh, to benefit major areas such as cancer, reproductive um, health, pregnancy, osteoporosis, and education. Mm -hmm. uh, and this was at a time when um, uh, breast cancer was the leading cause of death mm -hmm. uh, of women from 35 to 50 in the United States. And as a result, um, thirty-five years ago, yes, was that. Was that and the I and I don't we've made. don't know what the uh, uh, statistics are today, but I know that the technology that came from the Hubble and others have uh, greatly improved how we're able to uh, 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 to deal with things like breast cancer. Mm -hmm. uh, in that case. Uh, there used to be very invasive um, surgery uh, that was done in order just to identify uh, the, the cancer and what you could do about it. And um, what we're able to do uh, because of the uh, technology was get down to what are now known as needle biopsies, where instead of uh, cutting open the, uh, uh, the skin, are able to use a needle to extract what you need to uh, uh, know what you're dealing with and then to deal with it. The but technology we, is just amazing. 35 years ago, yes, breast cancer was one of the leading, was maybe the leading cause of death among women. Now I think it's heart disease. Well, uh, the, yeah, it depends on what uh, frame of uh, age that you're well, taking ages, a look yeah, at. Oh, ages, yeah, right, of course, uh, yeah. But the... Uh, 
but I think you know you could well do many many uh, uh, podcasts on just spinoffs. We could do a lot of video podcasts on spinoffs, and we thank you watching our conversation with Hugh Harris. 35 years with NASA, Public Affairs Office. He was uh, the Actually, voice of NASA. Actually, let, let me interrupt. Yeah. The, I'm, I'm still, well, one of the things that I did while I was a director out there was to establish the uh, volunteer program for retirees, both civil service and uh, contractor. So in just, uh, uh, well, a little less than a year, I will have been badged as uh, poor NASA for 60 years. Badged for 60 years. Well, we will celebrate that when we have you on for our April program there, Hugh. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he doesn't like the word retired. I don't think I'll ever like the word retired. No, I don't. Uh, believe though Marty's that. retired, he's as active as ever and everything. But uh, thank you. We've got uh, Jane Hodges watching us, Christopher Mick is an educator in Wisconsin. We got the UCAC brothers, Tom and Mark. I owe Mark a, a phone call, and uh, I'll get to that. Robert Law is in, uh, he's in Dundee, Scotland, mm -hmm. probably enjoying his evening cocktail. Uh, Carlton Bailey, post, we posted a, 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 well, I'm not going to say weird, but it was an interesting photo you took. It's like a 3D moving around that I've got on Facebook there. Uh, Melissa Pope is in her new offices at the Space Coast Office of Tourism. Uh, great partners to our nonprofits here on the Space Coast. Uh, Scott Polk, hello to you from Hobart, Australia. Uh, Jim McGuire and uh, Keith Sewell, Professor Keith, hope you're recovering uh, after those stints that he had put in. And we thank all of you watching this on Facebook Live, YouTube, Twitch, and Spotify. Tell your friends that this is the only place where you can see n actual NASA legends like Mr. Hugh Harris have a have a nice conversation with us here on Stay Curious with Marty Winkle and myself inside the Hyatt Place Studios here inside our museum in downtown Titusville, Hugh. Well, we're going to talk about a couple other things here before we get out of our Stay Curious program. One of them, I, I love this, that NASA had to put a left-hand turn into the <laughs> going out to the, uh, the Pad 39A. Why would they do that, Hugh? <laughs> well, Why not just make a straight <laughs> shot all the way? Is it the lay of the land out there? Or? Well, yes, it, it has to do with the, that. And the fact that you have um, uh, two pads, and, um, but the, uh, the land there is, uh, uh, was very swampy, and the, uh, it was not easy. Uh, uh, they they tried a number of ways to uh, create a way to take the uh, the shuttle out there, and the one of them involved the use of asphalt, and um, the problem was they discovered when they tried to make a turn uh, uh, to go up the uh, the ramp to the pad, the uh, the treads on the uh, uh, on the crawler would pick up the asphalt and throw it off to the side. Mm. And um, the, the, one of the original uh, suggestions was that it actually be, uh, you build a canal that went from the VAB out to the pad and use sort of a, bar, a barge type of um, vehicle to uh, carry the uh, Saturn V out there. Using the buoyancy of water right. on there. That's and, it. I've never seen anything about that. I'd love to see some concepts of that. Well, there, uh, <clears throat> it was finally decided. Uh, well, after the uh, failure of the asphalt idea, uh, but and that was after it was decided, no, we're going to keep it all land that mm -hmm. you go across. Um, then... Uh, the, and I'm not sure who should get the credit for it, but um, they took a look at River Rock as the uh, uh, having the surface, and it goes down. Uh, actually, the it goes down about seven feet. Um, the uh, the substrata for the uh, crawler, 
and uh, really provides, it goes down seven feet. It provides. Marty, make that bigger for me, sir. There. It provides a uh, sort of a ball bearing surface. Uh, eventually, the the river rock, which is very very tough, um, is uh, smashed into sort of dust uh, and has to be replaced. But um, it Tennessee River rock, by the way, from the Tennessee right. River. Because it doesn't create a spark. Yes. Yeah, was the big deal. Was they didn't want any sparks being crushed underneath that. That was a one ton. Each was one ton. The 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 pedals was one. I, or two I think tons. you're yeah. right. I think it was one no. ton. Two tons. Marty says two tons <laughs> each. Uh, uh, tong or or whatever you call the tread. Each the, tread the on tread, there was two yeah. tons. We, it's two thousand pounds. One ton. Oh, okay. Two yeah, All right. one ton. We, and we've got a, a, a fourth of one here in our museum there. Well, you know, that's, that's why we have Hugh here to talk about things that uh, I like putting up pictures and hearing what he has to say about them. Uh, I didn't know that they thought that asphalt would would work. on a, Well, it works on highways. Yeah, well, yeah but not on a 200-ton uh, spacecraft there. But uh, anyway, beautiful picture. That is STS-3 going out to the pad that we're going to talk about here, STS-3, with these two astronauts. Uh, that is Ken Mattingly on the left, and on the right there's Jack Lausema. Uh, uh, certainly brave individuals. We found out by a guest we had here uh, last week, Erin Lewis, who is over a, a museum called, she's in, in education. Hi, Erin, hope you're watching. Uh, the uh, Air Zoo in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Hmm. Uh, looks, is, have you ever heard of that place? The Air Zoo uh, in Kalamazoo, Michigan. No, but it certainly sounds appropriate. It does. Uh, she said that these suits that the, pol that the first uh, shuttle astronauts used were actually for the Blackbird uh, hmm. uh, mm -hmm. a reconnaissance plane, right. the SR-71 yes. SR Blackbird, yeah. because they they hadn't uh, finished building the uh, shuttle suits yet. Mm -hmm. And then they ended up not using shuttle suits, just uh, uh, coveralls, because right. they thought it was so safe. But this was the third flight of Columbia. They deployed a space uh, satellite. They did some other things with it. Uh, in their, uh, their, I love these beautiful pictures. Just kind of put in there for you, Hugh, as I consult my shuttle scroll here to find out, oh, they were up there seven days. Well, from actually, the 22nd to the 30th. I well, thought it was a four or five days. Actually, eight days. Uh, yeah, eight days. They And that was because of having to change the landing um, uh, place. From uh, Edwards Air Force Base, where they had uh, 20 miles <clears> of <throat> runway that it got swamped. It got, they had uh, unusual rains out there. That's right. Uh, here, and, here's the crawler. I just kind of threw that in there to get the sizes. Uh, this is, by the way... Of course, 1982. So I suppose that's a Ford Econo line there, very famous car that, that uh, <laughs> you guys probably bought a lot of. Uh, but there's the beautiful launch. Um, again, only the third time these photographers have been out there photographing a shuttle. Uh, so there's a lot of unknowns with film and so forth back mm -hmm. in the day as a photographer. Uh, and you, you credentialed the people to go out there to do that, obviously. Uh, right. Now, we were at that time uh, on the first, the first launch and for a number of the, uh, the launches after that, we had as many as 2,000 media there. 2,000 for the and, early launches. Wow. And uh, All around I, the world, of course. It, from all around mm -hmm. the world, right. And uh, I think that's going to happen again when we start going back to the moon. And um, it'll be interesting how the, uh, the new people <laughs> learn to deal with that many press. Well, the, if they uh, need some tips out there, new people, I've got his phone number. I'll call him and have him get in okay. touch with you there to handle uh, it. Well, one of the things, uh, when we, on the first launch, we didn't have the facilities at the press site uh, that was a whole change in the way we de dealt with the press. and um, Really? From the Apollo era to the shuttle, yeah, of course, it was uh, eight years. On the Apollo launches, uh, the press was mostly bussed out. Uh, we had um, 
uh, press offices down in Cocoa Beach or in Cape Canaveral, and um, then the uh, the press would get on buses and would be brought out. They weren't allowed to uh, drive themselves out. And um, as we got into uh, uh, the shuttle, um, the uh, uh, the the people that I work with in public affairs uh, realized that this was a tremendous cost uh, to NASA and to the center uh, hmm. to provide the transportation and also probably was not all that necessary. Um, you you could, you know, keep everything safe um, and still have people drive out to the press site, uh, the the media, uh, who were properly badged and uh, and checked, and um, do it much more efficiently hmm. and uh, and at a, a much lower cost to the government. And no liability uh, on a right. bus or anything yeah. like that. That's interesting. I'm sure Tom Usiak's interested in that, being one of the early shuttle photographers. We're going to have Tom Usiak here. I believe we scheduled Tom for uh, Monday, April fourth, uh, and uh, which we'd like. We'll have you back April fifth on Tuesday, Hugh. Well, and I, I'll, I will watch uh, for. Uh, uh, well, the UCAC uh, brothers are, you know, just great photographers. Yes, and, they uh, are, uh, and we're going to uh, get Tom in something dear to your heart, the Chroniclers. Okay, we talked about that on the phone. Hopefully, and, yes. Uh, 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 tell us about the Chroniclers, something that you helped create. Well, the uh, one of the things that I'm, you know, believe is the, uh, the uh, is that there's really a partnership between the media and government agencies, and that both of them have a job to do and an a important um, obligation uh, to communicate with the public. Uh, in, in our democracy, uh, the public needs to know uh, what's being done and with their tax dollars and uh, what is coming from that. But the, uh, uh, also, the, uh, they need to know that what they're hearing about uh, is accurate and true. And um, so the, uh, the one of the, you know, the, we, we have some of the uh, greatest uh, uh, reporting uh, of any country in the world as far as uh, keeping people abreast of what's actually happening and um, and being dependable, and I'm not talking now about some of the uh, the way that the um, uh, virtual media is uh, dealing, where there's a lot of opinion. Mm -hmm. But in order to to do that, it's important that uh, you you know have respect for each other, and that you help each other uh, do the job. Uh, the Media want to uh, tell people what's happening, how it's happening, both good and bad. And the government agency like, like NASA uh, wants that story to be told, both good and bad, uh, because it's in, in order for uh, people to decide what's important, uh, it's important that they be informed so I've always felt that um, the, uh, the media are really uh, an extension of um, th our, the ability of the agency to communicate with people. And um, so they're, they're sort of a part of the, mm -hmm. uh, of the whole program, and luckily uh, they're, they, they're not government employees, and you're not uh, doing the, the whole information thing uh, based on taxpayer dollars. You're letting private industry um, finance the, uh, the gathering and the dissemination of news. Well, you helped create 
the Chroniclers, well, which the, honors the news right. media and people who are, who are doing just what you what you're talking about. Now, the what we I did with the Chroniclers um, uh, when I set up the uh, sort of the rules for it was that you could not be on the uh, uh, become a chronicler and be on the wall at the press site um, and receive a certificate. Um, until you were no longer uh, uh, employed as a reporter, so there would be no hint of favoritism mm -hmm. as uh, or any uh, that no reporter would feel, well, you know, they, they did this for me, and so I need to, uh, uh, you know, slant what I'm talking about. Right. So the, um, the Chroniclers is to honor and recognize the uh, the value that reporters make to our country and to um, uh, to everybody here uh, in the United States and um, the uh, but in a way that um, you know doesn't uh, make them beholden because they are being right. given any special privileges. Well, your chronicler's wall has been a little empty during COVID because you said your committee's not been meeting and so forth like that. And we'd love to well, see you get that resurrected. And, well, I'm, and, I'm uh, hoping that uh, uh, it will continue. Uh, we, uh, it, it needs to be. There's a lot of uh, deserving people out there. Yes. Uh, and then there's some people like John Zarella of CNN. He'll probably never retire. Uh, in there, like you technically are sort of still working, but I did want to mention that we're going to talk more about the chroniclers and and uh, talked about uh, helping you get you know some uh, you need some help uh, getting that back on track. We'd love to help you with that uh, on there. And uh, but that uh, it is something that you have initiated and, and are proud of that 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 you've got the, the press site, you've got a wall of honor there. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's like our wall of uh, for space workers that we have at our Space View Park. Marty's out there in a couple different right. places out there. Uh, so uh, we wanted to mention that that, that uh, the, the 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 press love them or leave them or hate them. We both been part of the media. We understand Hugh and I both both sides of the story. And uh, sometimes, you know, one side gets skewed more than the other, and that's not usually the reporter's fault. That's uh, the guy who's paying the reporter's bills <laughs> sometimes <laughs> says, uh, we're not running that story or, or, or put that story on the front page. But, Hugh, here we have what was an amazing one-time story in the shuttle's illustrious history was we landed on a gypsum salt bed. In uh, uh, on uh, uh, frightening March thirtieth, nineteen eighty-two. Yes, they had to bring them down. They were up for eight days. They couldn't keep them up another day. And Hugh, tell our stay curious watchers the logistical nightmare to all the equipment that had to go out there. Well, it you know the 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 space shuttle requires. Uh, a, a lot of help. I mean, if you land it out there, you got to bring it back to wherever <laughs> it's going to be refitted and everything. But in order to do it properly, there were 40 train uh, box cars full of equipment. He didn't say had, four. Forty. That's right. Train box cars and more than one locomotive. <laughs> right to get everything out there. Uh, now, there's two ways of doing it. One, you could fly it out there, have the Air Force do it, um, or some other, you know, commercial uh, aviation do it. Uh, however, by using the trains, uh, there was more than $2 million that was saved hmm. in the cost of moving all of the equipment out there and then back again. Uh, to uh, California, where uh, it was based in the first place, but um, equipment we're thinking about is the safing of all the, the the noxious fumes coming out of there. But this picture will give you more of an example: is you had to create a mate demate device. That's right. Uh, out of uh, 
what was available. So they brought a bunch of cranes out there. There is a mate demate device that is a structure that's built to lift up the shuttle so that the 747 that is, is uh, uh, modified to fly the shuttle either back to California or uh, 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 KSC. So what a contraption, Hugh. Well, <laughs> and, and it really looks like that. If you look at the uh, mate mate devices uh, at uh, KSC, uh, you can see that that's a tremendous structure. Uh, but lifting up a shuttle uh, and, putting it, and putting it on the back of a uh, 747 uh, is uh, not easy. But uh, the um, one of the things, I don't know whether you want to get to that yet, um, the, uh, that, that was a, uh, had an interesting um, uh, after uh, effect uh, when mm -hmm. uh, on, on the early shuttle flights, uh, the crew members, in this case, uh, Jack Lausma and um, Gordon Fullerton, and Gordon Fullerton uh, were sent on uh, trips overseas to various countries to talk about um, the purpose of the space shuttle, what it was like, and uh, how what their experience was like. Um, and uh, one of the things that uh, was made possible when the uh, 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 the uh, time for it to come back was extended that there was a, uh, a day there when they didn't have a minute-by-minute -minute, uh, schedule of things they had to do, and they were able to take more pictures and uh, uh, enjoy themselves uh, a little bit. And I think, um, I, I'm not sure whether it was Lausma, but uh, uh, he talked about it being a perfect place to uh, vacation <laughs> um, on that particular day. Uh, but one of the things that he did, he took a lot of pictures, and uh, when they went to the various countries that they visited, uh, they showed those pictures. And um, they, one of the places they went was China. Hmm. And um, while they were up there, they had taken a picture of a beautiful em uh, emerald colored lake in China, and uh, they thought it was, uh, you know, just a magnificent picture. And um, they showed it to the audience uh, uh, where they were, uh, which was near the um, facilities that the Chinese had their uh, uh, space center. And um, the reaction of the crowd was not one of sort of admiration of the picture, but I suspect, and I don't know this for sure, was more of an intaking of breath, like, what is that? And um, it turned out that it uh, was a picture of a top secret uh, nuclear test site <laughs> that the Chinese had. Oh. <laughs> and uh, uh, which, uh, you know, the um, astronauts had no idea that that's what they were showing. And I think the Chinese might have said something like, we don't want them flying over us anymore. Right. Wow, but, that's uh, interesting. Huh. We've had the, uh, uh, that's interesting. Yeah, a lot of those that would have been film pictures on beautiful Hasselblad cameras. So, uh, uh, yeah, you never know back then. People weren't, didn't see normal images of the Earth like we see now uh, with all these small satellites providing mm -hmm. your roof so a roofing company can show you that you need shingles. Here was the look of getting that 747 off the ground there on that gypsum. But uh, tell everyone about how that, how they never forgot about this flight because of the sand. Well... The, uh, the the gypsum uh, sand is a very very fine uh, particle, and um, so they they spent a 
a great deal of time uh, when they got the uh, uh, shuttle back, uh, cleaning it up and trying to get it out of every crack that uh, uh, was in it that it could have settled in. But Charlie Bolton, uh, uh, who flew on the, uh, that shuttle uh, afterwards, and, uh, and others uh, reported that there was gypsum that was still in it that would come flying out when they got into the weightlessness of space up until the last flight. And so they never were able to get all of the, uh, the gypsum out of there. 20, now, 27 flights after this one. That's after right. After 28 it, flights, they always saw some gypsum sand come up from somewhere in a crack or the well or something. <laughs> well, that I, I suspect that that could have well gone into uh, the decision that you're not going to land there unless it's absolutely necessary. Yeah. Now, it might, they had a choice. They didn't have to land there. They could have landed at uh, the Kennedy Space Center because we were ready for landings. However, in the training, uh, the astronauts had uh, uh, practiced with uh, their T-38s and the training aircraft to land at White Sands, and they decided since they had had that practice, well, we might as well come down at White Sands. Mm -hmm. So it became... Um, a logistic nightmare from the standpoint that you had to get it out of there. Uh, it would have been easier to get out of KSC yeah. than it would have uh, 40 there. 40 train boxcars <laughs> uh, and uh, to get out there to White Sands, New Mexico uh, on, on what, what is a very historic flight. Uh, there is Ken Mattingly, a, a picture of him a few years ago. Uh, uh, and many do, do, do I've never met him. Any dealings with Ken? Uh, uh, well, I I've met him and talked to him, but uh, you know nothing uh, uh, jumps out that uh, he orbited the moon, of course, in Apollo ten. Uh, true test pilot, uh, and uh, and then I got to brag a little bit that I got to meet Jack uh, Lausma at the Apollo thirteen event with Marty. Uh, oh, there's Mark Usiak over my shoulder there. Mm -hmm. It must have been a selfie I took with him. Uh, boy, he's a very interesting, wonderful guy. Uh, uh, he told me the story that he, in, when he was at uh, Moscow training, uh, doing stuff in Star City, uh, he got to, he, he, he drove with the conductor of a train going into Star City. Oh, my goodness. He was the conductor of a train on 12 to 13 stops, uh, like for over an hour and a half. Uh, they knew he was an astronaut, and they got him up there in the cab, and then they said, well, put your hands on this, he's telling me, and then start moving that. Next thing you know, Jack Lausman was driving the train and uh, going to Star City in there. He loved, he loved telling that story to uh, uh, Mark Usiak and me back there. Well, there's people who believe astronauts can do anything. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> but a shout out to him. And we're trying to effort doing a Stay Curious with him during this mission, uh, either on his landing or the launch there that last week of March. So, uh, Hugh, thank you so much for giving us a good uh, coming here this afternoon. Marty, you've got a question? A long one. <laughs> a long question. Okay. The key return. After the Chinese picture incident, then NASA tells future crews not to photograph certain parts of the Earth's surface to avoid this problem. And then he said, I remember the crew of STS-9, I believe, had photographed a forbidden place on the list. Or was it this incident that was that caused the ban? Oh. Did you get all that? Uh, yes, I, I heard all of that. And, of course, I was not involved in that sort of thing, so I, I don't really know whether that was the trigger for that or not. But I wouldn't be surprised. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the trajectory maps, uh, I've seen them. They know where they're going, you know, mm -hmm. every, every moment of a, of a mission almost oh, yeah. in there. But, well, thank you for that. Was that UCAC? No, it was a McKeever. McKeever. 
Okay, thank you for adding that there and helping us stay curious. Well, you know, one thing that I, I think uh, it was really, uh, you know, the, the world has changed a lot since that particular flight. And with the, the satellites that are used today, uh, I don't think there's any place where you can't get a picture of if you're really interested. Well, yes, and, and I'm making no joke if you had a, there's companies that have small sats up there just to photograph your mm -hmm. roof. That's right. And and will sell that data to the uh, roofing people, and they come to you and say, you know, well, here's a picture of your roof. You know, they don't might not tell you it's from a satellite 200 miles up high. <laughs> they, All right. Uh, they can see you, the color of your dog and everything there. So, well, we have certainly enjoyed another wonderful hour talking to Mr. Hugh Harris, Public Affairs Office, badged at Kennedy Space Center for 59 years and counting, okay. And when we see you next month, we'll, we'll celebrate your 60th years of, of being badged out there. I wonder if anybody else has been badged as long as you have, Hugh. Do you? I, I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. they, uh, there are people who uh, spent more years working uh, uh, full time than I did, I know. You got a beautiful STS-134 Endeavor shirt on there, the final flight of Endeavor, which uh, consulted my scroll here. I know it was in 2011, but that was launched on uh, in May, in April, uh, April 29th, about that time frame. Uh, it was in there. So, uh, but we appreciate you, you being here, Hugh. You, you want to add anything else to our Stay Curious conversation today? Well, I think you should come back and do this again. I think we'll do that again. <laughs> thank you very much, sir, for helping everyone out there stay curious. And thank you to the Hyatt Place studios that we're coming from, a, a, a new partner with the American Space Museum that we're going to uh, conduct some conferences out there. And it should be your place to stay. It's uh, the, uh, the closest uh, hotel to Kennedy Space Center right now. Hmm. Um, Delaware North is building one just a little bit closer uh, there, but it's a beautiful hotel and we appreciate Robert and Dana uh, uh, taking care of you on your next visit here to the Space Coast. So, Hugh, thank you very much. Marty, thank you for all that you've done today, uh, making a great uh, show with Mr. Hugh Harris. And uh, tomorrow's Friday and uh, so you know what that is. That's Tales from the White Room with the one and only Travis Todd Thompson, Triple T. So on behalf of our wonderful museum and Hugh Harris, I'm Mark Marquette, and we will see you tomorrow with Tales from the White Room to bridge the space between us. <laughs>